thanks IPL team students for having me here. Uh, I know it's not, I hope it's not too late, but wish you all a happy new year. We just started a new year with this. Uh, I'm really excited to be in front of a bunch of really budding product managers uh, to share my experience over here. The only time I get to speak to budding product managers is when I'm interviewing them for, for a role in metric stream. So that's the only time I get to speak to them. I'm sure you'll agree this is a better time, a better, better forum for us to discuss. And uh, I know it's 1 p.m. on a Sunday afternoon. This is not the best time to have a session like this. I tried my best to, to, to um, with, I tried my best to actually move it to a 9 a.m. slot. I negotiated really hard, but that didn't work out. So one thing I've done is I've cut down my slides from 45 to 15. So I hope all of it will be good for all of us. So that's one thing I've done. And uh, I would uh, strongly urge all of you to keep this highly conversational. Uh, the idea is not for me to just present stuff. I'm just going to share you some perspectives on what I've done uh, over the last year or so. Uh, but the idea is for, for me to get ideas, questions, thoughts, comments from all of you and keep it conversational. I come from the B2B space, so all my conversations will be related to B2B. Uh, so I just wanted to set that context. Uh, please feel free to stop me at any point of time as I go through the slides, topic, subtopic wise, you can stop me, ask me questions. I'll be more than happy to discuss them. Yeah, so let's get started. So for today's topics, you've already heard about uh, how cloud analytics can influence product roadmaps. So that's been the key theme. Uh, that's something we're going to discuss. The second topic is going with the cloud theme. What does it mean for product managers in the times for cloud first, agile, and DevOps? I see some of your profiles are already in DevOps, some of you in the cloud analytics, but this is something we'll look at. What are the three or four things that we need to worry about? We'll also look at how to run an alpha or a beta program uh, for B2B products. So we just went through a phase where we ran an extensive beta program. We'll look at some of the do's and don'ts, things that you need to keep in mind while running a beta program. I'll try to keep it very contextual to what I do in metric stream. Because the theoretical part, I'm sure IPL covers a lot of that. So I'll try to keep it more or less with what we do and then hear your perspectives on that. Yeah. So let's get started. And the last one, one bonus topic, I said this is the time for resolutions. So I said we'll have some new year resolutions for product managers. This is something I'm going to play out back in metric stream. I'm going to go to my product managers and play this out and talk about those five things. Uh, so we'll also look at some of those resolutions as we go along. Yeah. So we look at a typical roadmap process. This is how we do it today in metric stream. And if you look up roadmap processes in your own organizations on the web, you'll find something, some, some variation of this. So you have a bunch of stakeholders who come in, you see on the left, it could be your partners, it could be customers, it could be engineering team coming up with innovations. It could be your marketing, bringing an outside in perspective. It could be uh, professional services. They are the ones who talk to a lot of customers. All of these guys bring in a lot of perspectives, a lot of ideas, inputs, and we who use the AHA tool. AHA is one of the road mapping tool. I don't, anyone familiar with AHA? A couple of you, so three of you. So we use AHA internally to manage our roadmap. So all of this flows into the roadmap. This works pretty well. This process works pretty well. Now what happens is at some point, the product management and product marketing team sits in and decides what needs to be built over the next 12 months, next 36 months. We come up with, typically come up with a statement of direction for the next 36 months and have a roadmap for the next 18 months. That, that's the cycle we follow. Now, what else should we consider when we're defining the roadmap? One, competitive analysis. So Metric Stream is a leading GRC player, leading independent GRC player. We compete with some of the real big shots in the industry, so we keep a tab on what's happening in the industry. We also bring in an analyst perspective, whether it's Gartner or Forrester, to hear in what's happening in the industry, what are the new trends. We, look, we also discuss with customers. We have a forum called the Metrics Team Special Interest Group. This is a forum where all customers come and discuss about the roadmap, we vet our ideas. We use them mostly like a sounding board to make sure that we're on the right track. And then we publish these roadmap to everyone. Now, underlying all of this, if you look at each of these stakeholders, if you really look at what they really mean is people. So I see a lot of people. People uh, at each stage, you, you go around each step, you see people, people, and more people, right? Now, when you involve people in the mix, what happens is you always get someone who's loud, someone who's having a lot of hold, someone very senior who can come and actually influence the roadmap and nudge you to build things that are not really required, right? So you'll always have, like say, a head of sales come to you and say, there is this one customer who's asked for this feature, but I want to build it, otherwise you're going to lose a deal and they can influence the roadmap. Now, what is it that you use to decide what to build, right? What, what are the parameters that you use? It just can't be people. 
So that's where we get into the theme of bringing in data to help you make those decision making. Now think about data that's there in the cloud from our customers following an overarching input to all of these stages that come in. At every stage, if you have data to prove that something you're doing is right or wrong, you can always use the data to defend or to make a decision. So that's the whole key theme of today's discussion. Uh, moving on, and stop me, I'll pause for a minute. Any thoughts, concerns about how it's run? This, this piece of the slide? This is all the stakeholders. So these are all my stakeholders. There are people coming in, they provide inputs, requirements, enhancement requests, which flow in. They all flow into, my, into this AHA tool. At this point, we sit together, work with the competition, with uh, the special interest group, which are customers, directly with customers, analysts, and then come up with a roadmap. So that's the current flow, but that's very people dependent and it's prone to error. MSIG is a metric stream special interest group for each of the products where we invite customers to provide input. We meet them once a quarter to provide inputs into, into the overall process. It's customer solution innovation group. They're more like a pre-sales group. Uh, the group that gives demos to customers, so that's like the demo team. No, they're not direct. This is the current process. So I'm still with the current process. We, they don't get involved in defining the roadmap, but we do use them as a sounding board. We do play it out to them. We meet them once a quarter. We tell them what's planned. Sometimes there are new emerging threads that have come in. There are new regulations that are in play. One of the products we manage is called the Internal Audit Product. What happens is IA is the International Institute of Internal Auditors. They come up with new guidelines. So those perspectives come in during these meetings and they are fed in. But the roadmap, the final decision is always made by the product management and the product marketing team. They just form in as inputs. Question actually. Um, so in the current process, right? <clears throat> So what I'm really seeing is that obviously customers and partners can directly feed the, the requirement into the tool, but uh, you know, on top of that sales, pre-sales can also feed the requirement. So is there, um, is there a set of, you know, guideline in terms of, you know, what, what is qualified as a requirement, what, what it should have at bare minimum uh, in, in the current process? Because I believe everybody would have a different way of looking at the same thing. And some people are very abstract in nature. They, they just say because the customer is pressing me, right, to get done with this deal, uh, this is an enhancement request. Let me put it into the system. So is there any, you guys as a product manager, because you, I assume, would obviously be looking at the tool and trying to read everything. What do you expect to be there at bare minimum for each and every requirement? So uh, what we really look at is, more than defining the requirement, uh, define the business use case or the pain point the customer is facing. What happens in most cases, you'll see some of the folks on the field, the stakeholders, will directly give you a requirement definition. So we, we have come up with a template, AHA lets you do that, as to what is the minimum information that's required. One is the current pain point, how is the customer currently using the system? It could be the business scenarios we're trying to address. So these are some of the key factors uh, we would expect from the field rather than giving us the requirement itself. Because what happens is that the requirement of the solution would basically address those problem statements, uh, but we expect that to come in as an input to us. Uh, your counterparts uh, really understand these points that, okay, this is how a pain point should be written. This is how a no. business scenario should be written. Uh, and for everything, they would need a hand-holding from you, right? That's right. Okay. So, so that comes to one of our newer resolutions that I'll, I'll talk about. But in most cases, you'll see all the information just being dumped into AHA and, and given to product managers saying that you figure it out. So there's a lot of to and fro that goes on. Uh, but that's, that's a general trend. And uh, I don't think we've solved it yet in Metric Stream. So that, that's a battle all product managers have to face as we go along. It's a road mapping tool, which it's so quite a well-known algorithm. It's, it's like a form. All the employees, partners actually can go and input your requirements. And depending on the product you select, the product manager gets to review it and either put it in the backlog or uh, put it in the roadmap. So you can do all of that. Correct. AHA is quite a popular tool in the product management space. So I highly recommend it, at least from us. 
So uh, what, what we'll do over the next two slides, I have looked at some of the data that we've captured from the cloud. So Metrics Team also is going through a cloud transformation, and I'm heading the cloud transformation initiative. The idea is most of our customers are large banks, and they like their systems to be on-premise. So now they're all moving towards to the cloud. So what that does is gives us a lot of access to the data, gives us access to how they're using the data, and now that's going to be an overarching input into our roadmap process. So that's the whole theme we're trying to play out. So I'll take you through a couple of slides. So hope you can read it. Um, I blurred a few customer names, so that's something I've done on purpose. But the clarity is not great, but just uh, bear with me for that. So what you see on the left is a set of features that are available in one of the products. Okay, think of them as different forms, different input screens, a bunch of features that are there on the left. And what you see on the top are all customer names. I've taken a sample of 20 customers for today's discussion. And what you see is for the last 18 months, starting say Jan of 2016 to October of 2018 or 2017, we have customer usage patterns that we're tracking in the system. And this is a B2B software, so you'll not see millions of records, you'll see them in hundreds and thousands. But for each of this, you've looked at, we've looked at, we've taken, mined the data and looked at what are the number of times they've actually accessed or used this particular feature. And what's interesting to note is, and I'll get into this, so the first form is called the audit planning and, and, uh, and scoping form, it's called the EPS form. It's a very key form within the auditing world. When you're conducting an internal audit, when banks go, uh, when say auditing groups go to banks to check if there's any fraud or detect fraud, that's one of the key forms where they do the scoping activity. What we figured out is that that's been used extensively. So what does it indicate to a product manager? One, yeah, you can put in additional dollars into that particular product, that particular feature. Yes. The second one is an audit setup milestone. Let's call it as the milestone definition feature. This is when a perspective of product manager gets into being more a narcissist or looking at his products and falling in love with his products, right? This is a feature we will debate it, built it, but now we figured out none of our customers use it. They don't have a concept where they have multiple milestones. They all come up with a fixed set of milestones. Now the question we really want to ask is, did we really over-engineer and go and build this out? The next piece is uh, something around uploads. We always make an assumption that customers upload a lot of historical data. Any issue with the with the audio? Okay, sorry about that. So there's also the other fifth, I'm just picking up four or five different examples. The other one was, hey, thanks, Aaron. I think that brought, brought in a lot more clarity. Is a concept called the draft issue form, which was heavily debated internally. Some of our stakeholders say, we're just wasting our time, we should not be doing it. Now, when we looked at our cloud data, that gave us a good validation that that has been used extensively. Right? And the last one, again, you see a managed audit form, which has been used extensively. Uh, now, when you look at this data, it, it can give you multiple perspectives. One, where to invest, which are the features you do not want to invest, or you want to even deprecate. Because the minute you use the word deprecate in any organization, they all get scared because they want the customers to get worried about it. Uh, they, sales or PS, they already want multiple features, right? They need many more features. If you say reducing features, they always get paranoid about it. They feel, they feel really bad about it. Now, the other perspective to look at when particular feature is not being used, is it not being used because it's not being designed well? Or is it not being used because customers don't find value in it? So those are questions you can ask and debate upon, and that's how the input comes into your product management. Now, so this is basically not, it's basically, you can put in your investments. You can invest in areas that are most used, and, and, and cut down the investments in the areas that are not used. That's the whole idea. Yeah. It's used quite a bit. I mean, there are some areas which, which actually have been used. This is just a perspective. I've just given an example with the sample so, data. Uh, yeah, one question is that is it, uh, um, I don't know a lot of details about the product as such, but is it a product which is hosted somewhere in the cloud and customers directly access it through the website yes. and then you guys monitor each and every element of the website to understand what is being used and what is not being used. That's right. Okay. So these apps are on our cloud, but it could be on Amazon cloud or on our own cloud. We host these, uh, these applications and we track the customer usage patterns. Because this is very kind of deep in terms of That's looking right. at each and every uh, field. And that's the whole idea, to how do we get to a mode where all the product management decisions are made on based on data and not on based on gut feel. That's the whole idea, right? I'll, I'll move to another, this is all on the reports and charts in the system. And again, then there are a few examples I'll call out. 
I've just taken, randomly picked a few examples on where we should invest more. So this is one of them is called the audit uh, list report. It's been used extensively and we keep getting enhancement requests from this feature. So we know one from the AHA tool that we get a lot of enhancement requests. Second, the data also is supporting that, that we need to invest into that. The second is the audit trail report. We know for a organization that's building GRC solutions, an audit trail report is very important. The perspective I get from this is that this is not built right or it's not giving all the information that the customers are looking for. If I look at the next example, uh, we built an interesting calendar view of audits. So if you look at the way you work on your tasks, you get a task, you log into an application, you have your my task inbox, you can open your task and you can respond to a task. The other way you would, you would get a task is you would get an email saying that approve something. You click on the link, it opens the feature or a form and you respond to that, correct? Or you go look at it in context of something else you're doing and you respond to that. What we did at some point is we built a calendar view for that, which is more like a monthly calendar view you see in Outlook, where you have all the tasks listed. And we were very excited because as soon as you get something which is uh, like an Outlook look and feel, we were all excited, built it. Now we realize when customer have three better options to actually access that particular form, the whole calendar view is something that did not really resonate well with customers. So now we're going to reduce our investments or at least at some point deprecate this feature. There are a few more examples, again, on where we can invest. There were things around top five. You see this last second last row. Uh, this was again a heavily debated. We sent out a note. Uh, the general process we follow is we sent out a note to all stakeholders. Let them know that a particular feature is getting deprecated. As soon as you hear the word deprecate, you'll see a lot of reactions within the organization. They say, no, no, somebody may need it sometime. And uh, now I can go back to them and tell them, you know what, this has been used once or twice and it looks more like an error. It's not really a usage. Because you can't imagine someone using this report once in one and a half year or two times, it just doesn't make sense. So I have a case to deprecate. And why deprecate? We'll talk about it. Yep. Now these are very simple use cases on how, have, once you have the cloud data with you, what else you can do with it, right? Sure, sure. We do both. So the M6 I spoke about, the special interest groups, is a forum where you would actually discuss this. Uh, but then if you just have an open discussion, it becomes very subjective. So we'll have data back saying that 20 sample customers have not used it. Do you see value in it, right? If uh, That'll be like a, like a final validation, but it'll now be data driven. But you would not do it for every feature because at some point the product manager has to take a call. But for some of the key features, we'll, we'll want to understand whether the customer is not using it because it's not been designed right or it's not useful to the customer. So that's a question sometimes you don't get an answer from you. Yes, yes. Yeah, that, that's a good point, yeah. That's how we do it. So any, any other questions on these two slides? Okay. So now let's get into three or four perspectives that I wanted to highlight. So we've looked at two perspectives right now. One, how do I get to know which areas I need to invest most? So cloud is one source, along with AHA and every other input that comes from our stakeholders, stakeholders, cloud will also validate that approach. So what that really means, the first point is you have to deprecate features. Once you move to the cloud and you move to a SaaS kind of a model, you can't keep building features over features which are not being used. At some point you need to deprecate. Why do you need to deprecate? Every time you upgrade a new a feature that's not being used, you'll spend cycles building it, you'll spend cycles testing it, and then supporting it. Now, when you talk about deprecate, you need less code, less support, and you save money, right? So that's, that's, that's clearly understood. The second one is invest in features that are most used, and also derive operational profile from the system. What that really means is, I have, I have some very interesting examples from the operational profile. The way we do it today, we have a business questionnaire that we send out to all our stakeholders and tell them, uh, tell me what's the max usage of the system, how many concurrent users you would have in the system, or how many, this is an audit application, so how many audits you would create in the system, or how many issues you would track in the system. Invariably, in most cases, you would get the max of max. If I ask people, uh, do you have three options, 10, 100, and 1,000, they'll always pick a 1,000. And it's, why are they doing that? One, they don't know. Number two, uh, they do not want to take the risk by giving a smaller number, because once you build it, they, hold, they, they are held accountable. Number three, they also want to keep it future safe. They don't know something may come up in the future. So no one wants to stick out the neck and say, you know what, you can just set, you can fix the system for 100. But if you end up building a max of max, you end up over-engineering the system. And uh, performance, any performance engineers in the room who built on performance? 
but but you understand that, right? So if you spend a lot of cycles, performance tuning is not not a two-day effort or a ten-day effort, right? It goes from months, and you every time you go to the P lab, you run a test, you go tune it, you run a test, and that goes on forever. And we ended up uh, investing cycles on tuning areas which customers never used. You never built for the max use case. You built for the average use case, correct? So now with this, what would happen is I can look at the customer data over the next over the last five years and come up with the average patterns. If there is one customer who's using it three times, four times more than their average, I have an example here. There's one customer, this customer, some specific name, he's into, they are into the auto industry. They're using it 57,000 times and the average is around 100. So there are two questions that would arise. One, are they using the system for the right uh, reasons? Second, what is it that they're doing in addition to what other customers are doing? So that perspective comes into product management. Now, but I would not build a system for that one customer. I would want to build it for my 80% of my customers, correct? So I'll follow the 80-20 rule. So that's on the system usage. Now, when you have, when you move to the cloud and you have data in the cloud, what you can also do is your A-B testing. There are certain features, very interesting concepts in the metrics stream app where you, different ways to visualize hierarchical data. Hierarchical data is if you have an issue and an action within it, how do you actually represent it? We came up with a particular mode and some customers like it, some customers give us feedback that things would have been done in a different way. Now what this allows me to do, if I have these 500 customers on cloud, I can release two sets of features, two variations of the features, one to a set of 50, uh, 250 customers and other to other 250. Based on the usage on cloud, I can actually decide which one's better. This is a standard way of doing your A-B testing, but that's one perspective we can do. Also understand user personas. We deal with a lot of compliance, quality, auditing professionals, and we always made an assumption that they're people with 20 years experience, 30 years experience. What we were pleasantly surprised to, to know that some of them are actually college grads who are all using consumerized apps like Facebooks and all the, all the end user apps. And they looked at our application and said, you know what, this doesn't work with us. We want things to be very intuitive. We want things to be self-explanatory. And those assumptions that we made actually went out of the window. Third, on browsers, you lead any report on the internet, you'll say Chrome has been used 50%. What we figured out, in our customer base, Chrome is only used 10%. So whenever I have to decide on a feature between Chrome versus uh, IE or Edge or any other browser, I can use my cloud data to actually make the call and what do I build, then rely on people. So the whole ideas of today's discussion is how do I move away from people-dependent, gut-feel-based decision-making to a data-driven decision-making. A uh, few more examples, okay, based on this, you can also know how people are navigating to the system. A good example is of the calendar view I spoke about, where we now know from cloud that they use it through my tasks, or they use it from a link in an email. They don't really use the, the calendar view, so that perspective can come in. Other things, how do I reduce time to complete a task? Um, that's something if a customer is taking five or 10 clicks to complete a task, how do I reduce it and make it simple, especially for the most used features? and then reduce time to complete task and get your data in lesser number of clicks. So these are some of the basic things we can do once we have data on cloud or we get into data driven. Now, what else can you do with data driven uh, product management? Second is we're looking at AI machine learning. This is the buzzword. I'm not an expert in AI machine learning. I know some of you have a profile. I've read the profiles with AI and machine learning. Now, what we really want to do, now that we have customer data, we want to mine the data and understand what's the mind of a GRC business user. So we build GRC products, right? We want to understand what is it that they do, why do they come to a metrics team application, and what is it that they do? So that's something we want to mine. Also want to help customer with what needs to be done. So we are in this world where there is data being input, there are reports being generated. You want to get into a mode where you want to be prescriptive and the system to let the customer know that now that you're in the situation, you've detected a fraud in a particular bank, what is it that you need to do to fix it? So we're getting into the world of prescriptive analytics, right? Also predict possible occurrences. This is very easy. Now, you've seen what our government of India is doing with the, with the demonetization. Now they've looked at all the data, looked at three months transactions before demonetization and two months after that. And now they've come up with reports as to who are the ones who had transactions which are above the permitted limits, right? Now you can do the similar activity over here. You can look at things happening in one area, one industry, and actually predict what are the possible scenarios other banks could expect in a similar area. So that's something we, we are thinking of doing. Also identify possible high risk scenarios. So I'll pause here for a minute and uh, want to understand your thoughts, comments on how do you see this playing out and what is, do you really see value in, in doing something like this?
So uh, that is true, but that's where we are actually going to one layer above that. Where actually, see, what you can do is, one is your standard web, web clicks, right? You can just track a number of clicks. That's a very base layer. So what we really want to get to is, is this point on understanding the mind of the GRC user. One is data helping you make your decisions, which is very like your Google Analytics, but we want to get to the next level where we get into predictive and prescriptive analytics, right? So that's when, when the data is there, based on the data, you want to actually go and help the customers, uh, uh, you know, use the system to the fullest. That's something that is work in progress. We are still building it out. Uh, but the, the most interesting cases we've seen is about issues. So we deal with a lot of governance risk compliance applications. So what happens is when there are banks, certain areas, they detect a certain kind of fraud, you can actually look at that and look at areas or industries, verticals of similar size uh, in a specific geography and actually come up with analysis for that. That's something we, we can do. Because issues is something that's very common across all GRC apps, finding incidents and issues. Yes. Yeah. So our that, that's that's a good that's a good good thought because our first step is to get to that to come up with a list of things or possible scenarios to the customers. That's the only guidance we can give at this point. But that's something we want to learn over a period of time. So so that's we don't have like a ready answer on how we want to do it. But we want to learn over a period. The first thing is if there is say fraud detected in one particular area, which is say in a banking domain in Europe, we want to make sure that all the other banks using it, get that notification that this is something you can, you can potentially look out for. So more like a suggestion at this point, but eventually it, it can get into predictive analytics. Or it can also help identify which are the areas they need to audit to, or where they can find possible fraud, right? So we also go through a process, it's very specific to the metric stream application where you, you, you have an internal audit app where you plan which are the banks you want to audit for the next 12 years, 12 months, right? Because the limit, resources are limited. Now with this, you can actually help provide some recommendations saying that these are the potential areas where you can find fraud based on what we already have in the system. So it will be more like a suggestion at this point, but eventually it will get into predictions. No, no, it's just a value add. At some point, we'll have to monetize it, but at this point, we're just trying to look at current customer data and give them analysis on what else could happen, what else could go wrong in the system. Yep. So, uh, so we have a suite of products, around 18 products. Each product manager do, uh, manages each product. Now we're also looking at an overarching theme where someone from the cloud group, the group that I head, will actually look at this across all apps. Because the data is not in silos, they're all interrelated to each other. That some of the features are not used, right? So uh, yeah, also, is there any way that we can track whatever the new features or the new uh, functionality we are adding, where it should be added so that sometimes it happens that it is useful, but the user is not finding it uh, accessible very easily. Hmm. So is that is also being... That is also being tracked. So if you look at this, um, getting to your data in lesser clicks and understanding users, so this will actually take care of it. We're also analyzing that data. Okay. Because if some things have been built and are not been used, we'll first look at the data. Yeah, because that can also possible that uh, we are Fair saying not. it is not being used, but we are duplicating. But actually true. user might be needing it, but he's not finding it in a normal workflow where he wants it to be. So is that factor also being that's, able that's to being considered? considered yeah. okay. That will be considered. So I'll quickly move on to the last. Was there a question? 
I'll just move on to the last piece. So this is on the overall program health. Uh, what we want to also achieve is help companies figure out what to do, what not to do, and if they have there's a better way to do it, right? So that's the whole perspective we want to give them. Uh, also rely on analytics to gauge the effectiveness of a GRC program. So what happens in most cases, you'll have the customer IT or someone uh, publishing saying that something's working or not working, but we want data to be, we want that also to be data driven. So this whole theme is around that. And also for product managers, we want them to provide this input to product managers so they can proactively look at emerging scenarios and react on it. Because most cases something happens, something blows up, and then the product manager tries to figure it out. And by the time he releases something to the field, it will take them another three, six months. So that's the whole idea to, to help product managers with this. So that's all I had with the cloud analytics. Before I move to the next topic on product management in the times of cloud first, agile, and DevOps. So I have three key points we'll just touch upon. I'll just share my perspectives, because we've also made a huge transition from a waterfall model to agile over the last three years. Um, and I'll tell you my learnings when, when we're talking about cloud first and agile, and what are the key points that I think will, will help all of us, right? The first thing is about agile way of thinking. Uh, it's also part of the resolutions. We'll talk about it when we get to that slide. But the whole idea is go with the theme of think big, but start small. So gone are the days where you would release something only once it's built, uh, designed, built, tested, verified, and then you release something over a period of six months, 12 months, right? Today, people are talking of releases that happen every month, every two weeks or so. So that's, that's where the trend is going. So we still are in the mode where we're releasing things every two months or four months. We want to get to a mode where we release it every month, right? Now, what that is, that means we move to a shorter cycle. We don't rely on the traditional uh, waterfall model of building things for or major releases. Also, what's important when you get to Agile is to involve customers. So in most organizations, what we've seen, one of the areas where the customers, where some of the competitors fail, is the, the Agile is adopted internally, but the customer is not aware of it. And if you look at any customer interaction, we make commits, firm commits, on a specific date with a set of features. We'll tell them you'll get five features in June of 2018. Agile doesn't work that way. So Agile gives you a flexibility to drop scope. So the whole idea is to include customers as part of your super Agile, have multiple touch points where you interact with the customers, share with them what's happening. So once they see real stuff getting built, they become part, they become stakeholders in your entire Agile process. So I'm sure uh, anyone, I mean, anyone who's not following Agile in the room, internally while development, not following Agile. So, so that's something you would see as a major benefit once you move to this mode, mode. And it definitely helps in setting the right expectations. Also build feature flags. This is an interesting concept that we are exploring right now. I thought I'd share it with you. The whole idea of you know, building something, build it with a feature flag in place so that you have a single source, one source that is actually deployed to all customers. You have like 30, 100, I would say 300 customers in the cloud, you're deploying the single source to everyone, but when you're building a feature, build it with a feature flag turned on in development mode. Now what that does is you don't have to have separate code bases for dev, production, or for preview mode, right? The second mode we're looking at is, look at a preview mode, where think of this as three simple flags, let's call it zero, one, and two. Zero is for development, one for preview, and two for production. Now, once I release it to customers, I want certain select customers to view it in a preview mode, and even in that customer base, only to the IT person. Now, I can turn on the flag as one to those specific set of customers. They can review it. If they feel it's, they're comfortable with it, roll it out to the entire organization, right? The third one is a standard production mode. There are some interesting tools in the market. You can look it up. It's called one of those tools that anyone uses, Jira. Quite a few, right? So the tool is called Launch Darkly. You can launch Darkly. L-A-U-N-C-H-D-A-R-K-L-Y, they actually provide an interface, uh, a mechanism to orchestrate these flags across multiple customers. So it's a cloud-based solution. You can go register all customers and users and actually orchestrate what goes in in every month patch. Now, the way it would typically work, the first month, everyone gets it with a zero. The second month, a select set gets it with a flag one so that they can preview it. Third month, all customers get it in production mode, right? So this tool actually helps you orchestrate that. So that's one, one, one piece I wanted to share. Second is cloud-first design. When you move to cloud, you've already written, heard about user stories. It has to follow the invest mode. So write smaller user stories, things that are independent, verifiable, and testable, so that every time a release goes out, it's not dependent on too many things. So that's that's a very, that's an art for all PMs to learn uh, and imbibe, because unless you get to this mode of writing user stories, getting into a cloud-first deployment would not really work. Second is make it intuitive and easy to use. Just imagine a world where every month you release a set of features, and the customer has to conduct trainings. The training budgets run in millions. So your product may cost much lesser, but the training would be 10 times more than that, right? So make it intuitive, make sure that, they, that it enables faster adoption. 
backward compatible in cloud world everything has to be backward compatible and you turn it off by default so when, when you release and make a new release to a customer they don't see the change immediately the admin would send out a notification and then turn it on for those specific customers there'll be customers who will not want to change things right and we're dealing with government organizations they want to change once in six months we let them do it with, the, with that pace so with the increasing focus on ROI we touched upon it in the initial slides all decisions should be data driven no more gut feel people based decision making so we want to go away from it and also importance of getting customers into the cycle to, to validate your approach or your designs early on right so this is where the metric stream special interest group comes into play right? so that's all I had for this for this topic uh, these are things we are actually uh, doing right uh, as we speak we're doing it in metric stream so that I'll share this perspective So when you move to a SaaS model, where you, so there are two ways you would, you would deploy, right? One could be your on-premise deployments, where you go through a traditional cycle, and customers can pick uh, the releases as and when they want. There is no mandate that they have to take every service pack that you release, right? So what happens in that, you end up having a huge backlog, that at some point when customers want to upgrade, they're almost 10, 10 versions of it, uh, back, and for them to upgrade is a major challenge. With cloud first, customers don't really have an option. So every time there's a new release, it's like a SaaS model, all customers get the release. The best they can get is deciding on the zero, one, and two, the flags, but they get, everything gets released to all customers in one shot. Think of it as one code base that goes to all customers. That's right, but so when you say, uh, can, can you give me, give me an example? That, that would be a challenge, I, I agree with that, but that's an interesting perspective. So the, the idea is we do have native apps. Uh, the first thing is the, all the designs are now responsive, so they work on smaller devices. So we're also trying to see if we can do away from the need to have a native app itself, because uh, all the, the latest version of Metric Stream is tested on smaller devices. But we do have native apps, and every time there is a dependency, that has to get upgraded. Uh, that's, that's a challenge we need to deal with. Yeah, but that, that's a good perspective. So you'll have product owners and product managers, right? So product owners are working with the product managers. Um, so so I, one of them, I think, told me they are an inbound product manager. Yeah, so so they, the, they mostly work with as a product owner, and the product manager manages a suite of products under them. But the product manager is involved as part of the cycle. Yeah. So I'll move on to... Uh, So uh, what we expect the product managers to do is to be part of your kickoff meetings when you're designing scope, uh, retrospective meetings. These are meetings we at least mandate the product managers to be part of. Uh, day to day stand up meetings, the product owner can, can join those meetings, but product manager can choose, depending on the criticality of the cycle, to, to join those day to day, -to -day stand up meetings or not. Yep. So how are we doing on time? I think we're good, right? There is two, two more topics. Um, this is the alpha program for B2B products. So when you think of alpha, in most cases, we look at it as a dev complete code that is being given to, say, a QA to test. Now, when we go to the cloud first model, and I'm talking mostly with the theme of cloud, you cannot wait for features to be released over the next three, six months before it gets to customers. You want early validation of all the features. So what we've done is we've, uh, the new platform is called M7. Metric Streams, uh, this, uh, the 7.0 version, we call it M7. We launched a whole concept called the Tri-M7. The whole idea is to give work in progress feature uh, access to, to our internal and external stakeholders. It could be your partners, it could be your internal sales folks. Um, also present these features to customers in your special interest groups. So the idea is present these concepts and get early feedback. What this does is if there are some low hanging fruits, you can fix it in the release. Or in some cases, if they feel it's, it's not really uh, worth it, you can actually drop the entire feature. So there are cases where we've actually gone ahead, built something, but we felt it's not useful. It's easy, it's better to drop it halfway through, then spend the entire cycle and then drop it. It doesn't really make sense. Uh, what we're trying to, ex the expected outcomes here, one is get early feedback, provide an outside-in view. 
so that customers can actually tell us the usefulness, usability of the features, give us inputs on the design. Um, again, opportunity to make changes. This also helps for sales to pitch in in critical situations when there is a feature asked, they can actually show the alpha version. And customers love to see real stuff, right? When you give them waferware or on a PPT, they'll say, you know what, I want to see something that's working. And if you're already cloud first and you know that releases come on a predictable cycle, every month there's a release that's going out, you can tell them this is currently work in progress and two months down the line you'll get it, right? So that's, that's where the alpha program comes in. Next I'll touch upon, I didn't have much about this. I'll talk about the beta program. It's mostly after the sprint is done. It's not uh, in production mode yet. The feature is completed. The basic feature works, the what do you call it, the positive flow works, or the happy path works, and that can be demonstrated. But it's not been QA'd or QA certified yet. So we go through three cycles, right? One is dev complete, happy path works fine, unit testing completed. Second is when you uh, have a QA certified. The third is when you do the integration testing with multiple products. So this is at the first stage, a sprint is complete, and you release it to the field so that they can actually demonstrate it. Yeah, and a sprint in metric stream is typically 10 days. I think that's generally the standard. Some of them use 15 days, but we use a two week cycle for a sprint. So next is on the beta program. Um, I thought I'll just touch upon this aspect. So this is what we've done. Uh, I've just typed off again the cust customer names. We've, uh, it's very interesting to have a beta for a B2B product vis-a-vis -a, -vis a B2C. B2C, the data volumes are huge. You can try out something on Flipkart and Amazon and get the f initial feedback and then turn it off. But in a B2B to engage practitioners who are actually people with 20, 30 years, senior director level people to get them engaged is a very Herculean task. So I thought it'll be interesting to share that perspective with all of you. Uh, we ran this, this is just the, the PPT that I presented to my to the management. We had like over 100 plus testers, some 150 findings and 80% participated, which was a, like a big, big hit for us. And these are the three or four apps that we let out for the one of the beta programs. We got some initial feedback from the customers. What they told us, they gave us some great feedback. They said they're satisfied with M7, the latest platform. They told us they, it met their expectations of quality. Some were not happy with the responsiveness, but they gave us the data. Some said visually appealing. The whole theme of this M7 was to make it intuitive, consumerized UI, so that it's like Facebook kind of UI for customers. So we, we achieved all of that, it was 100%. Now what does it take to actually uh, manage and plan a successful beta program? So that's what we're going to discuss now. You've just seen the backdrop on the final outcome. For a beta program, the first most important thing is to identify clear goals. So you have to focus on goals as to what is it that you want to achieve from a beta. In most cases, beta is understood that it's for bug testing. You want customers to test and tell you if there are additional bugs, but that's a given. Beyond that, you also need to identify what else you want to achieve from this beta. In our case, we had a clear expectation. We wanted to get feedback on the usability. We wanted, since this was primarily driven on usability, we wanted to get feedback on that. We wanted to get feedback on some of the key new features that we introduced in the application. So we had a set of predefined requirements or goals we wanted to achieve as part of the beta. So that's the most critical piece. Uh, we also had to get, we also need to get buy-in from key stakeholders because in most cases, the account managers, leadership, they are in touch with the customers to understand what is it that we want to achieve from the overall program. So that's the first step. The second step is detailed planning communication. I mean, it's, it's a completely different ball game than running a product because here you're dealing with customers, partners, and in most cases, product managers do not directly deal with customers in a B2B kind of a scenario. But here you're dealing with them. It comes from, start from creating a mailer, communication channel, giving them enough time to test, signing them up for those, for those two weeks of beta testing. All of them is a responsibility of the product managers. It also includes detailed training. It's a completely brand new UI, unless, unlike a B2C application, here you need to give them adequate training so that they actually test it and they give you feedback out of it. Third is to recruit beta testers. The best case is from your existing customers who have used your previous version. So they'll, they'll be the best people to tell you the difference between what's, what was there versus what has been released. Your partners, you also can get uh, SMEs involved and also select prospects. There are customers who have not your, who are not on board yet, but based on your new platform, they want to still wait before they actually make a call on which, which product to buy. So that's, that's your, uh, that's your case on recruiting beta testers. Uh, providing a stable product, I mean, you're asking some very senior people to invest time on testing it, so that's that's like a must. Uh, sometimes we tend to overlook it, we give them like alpha versions. In this case, it's a beta testing. It means it has been tested by dev, uh, I mean, it's been tested, unit tested, QA has tested, they found some issues, but there are no blocker critical issues. All the happy paths should work fine, right? 
Running the program, that itself is a big deal. So in Metrixtream, I got an opportunity to run the program. So this whole idea was to communicate, set up systems, also build up a knowledge base. This is also a good time to understand what are the kinds of questions customers would ask. When they are in a particular application, where is it that they get stuck? So each of them can form your knowledge base. So we almost sometimes uh, invest less on a knowledge base, but the whole idea is to use the beta to actually start building a knowledge base and help the customers actually build it out. And the most important, being responsive, support. This is, I think, a critical piece. At any every stage, you need to ensure that customers have been responded to either by Bex or by, by a call. Make sure that you are attentive to them. Uh, that's on the responsive piece. What we also did, interestingly, is uh, uh, introduce tools like Bugherd. It was a nice tool where it was plugged in within the application. Instead of opening a whole big Jira form, Bugherd actually integrates with Jira. We use the tool where you can actually fill in one or two fields and submit it, because customers will not have time to fill in, fill in an entire Jira list, right? So we did that. There are other interesting tools like Inspectlet and other tools which actually can track the behavior of the user. It can track where the user clicked and how did they actually navigate. So we introduced all of that. Collecting feedback, again, the, the topic of today, uh, cloud analytics, so we looked at usage patterns. We also monitored performance from different regions. We had customers in Far East, Middle East, Europe, uh, Eastern Europe, testing it from Czech Republic. We could actually get, get real feedback as to what is it that they were facing or the times they were actually seeing the forms load. So that is the direct feedback we received. And we also ended it up with a feedback on the overall survey. I showed you two or three snippets of the, of the survey results. And final result, final report is the most important, translating this BTF feedback into specific product requirements, and also translate, also uh, sharing the final outcome with the beta tester. So that's very important. So these are like the eight steps that we followed uh, for a successful beta. So I'll leave you with that thought. Uh, any questions, thoughts about beta program, we can discuss it. Whatever the app you have, yes. Uh, but then you mentioned that uh, here you actually carry out the training before you give them uh, the product, right? So whether giving the training before uh, doing the visibility testing because that will defeat the purpose of the. That's right. So we had a dedicated usability track okay. for the, for this. So if you look at the one of the slides, I just called out like five customers around sixteen testers on the fourth. This is the general usability. We just had a dedicated track for it, uh, but it's a little tricky. So here you have a mixed set of people. If you have customers you've used 6x, the previous version, and they are moving on to a latest platform, you don't need to train them. Mm. They, they, get, they can use it directly. So they, we got that perspective. We also got a new set of partners who are seeing the application for the very first time. Mm. So they didn't know the domain. So in those cases, you had to give them training. And then we had a dedicated track on usability for each feature. What is it that they're expecting? What is it that we achieved? We also did that. So it was like an all-round effort, uh, but in some cases, yeah, if you, if you do a detailed training, you defeat the purpose yeah. of actually getting them to give you feedback, yeah. Any thoughts on a beta program? Customer, prospects, potentially, partners. Uh, this is assuming all our internal testing is already done. No, uh, in alpha, there is no testing. So alpha is mostly driven by metric stream. We share it with them. It's mostly driven by us. We share it with them, uh, but it's run by a metric stream employee. Uh, there is there is no, this. the feedback is at a very high level or at a conceptual level, if you will. No, we're not sharing, uh, basically we're not giving them the URL to log in and test. We are demonstrating it to them during alpha. Yes, yeah. This is basically to get a buy-in on the concepts, on the features, usefulness of features, understanding potential use cases that we have not covered, things like that. Asking the customer. Customer would log in and test during beta. Yeah. Any thoughts on this? Anyone has run, been part of the beta program, run internally within your organization? Anyone has experienced in that? I see two hands go up, so that's interesting. So any any additional perspectives you want to share from, from your experience?
they, they share their feedback. Okay, that's interesting. So last one for the day. So let's look at new year resolutions. I'm sure all of you have made new year resolutions. At least I've made mine. So uh, and it's always interesting when you talk about new year resolutions. And we always hope as product managers when we come in the month of Jan that we get this two months off where we don't do any product development cycle and we can start come come in Jan. I'm still on vacation by the way. Tomorrow is my first day to office this year. So when you come come tomorrow, 8th of Jan, we start with a clean slate. Right? We all wish as product managers that will happen, but that never happens. So what I would just, what I'm sure when I go into office tomorrow, what I'll figure out is my backlog from December just increased. It added another probably 50 more requirements for each of my products. And there are requirements that are vying for attention. There are conflicting requirements that are coming in from customers. Uh, that's, there is no luxury, product managers never have a luxury of having it go easy, right? They're always busy throughout the year. So uh, with that, I was reading an interest, I was looking at resolutions and I stumbled upon PM resolutions. I found some interesting articles. I thought I'd share it with you since uh, this was, I thought I'd leave it this as a closing comment. The five things that we, I thought would, would help, uh, and this comes from one of the very interesting articles that I read, is first is reducing, if you look at this, this ties back to all our resolutions, right? We want to be fit, we want to lose weight, we want to travel all the world, we're talking about work-life balance, we're talking about learning new languages. At least I'm planning to learn Spanish this year. So there are five things we always talk about. Now, what does it mean to product managers? Taking five kilos off your backlog, someone asked a question, uh, how do you get the requirements? Is it in a format that you need? Uh, the answer is no, not always. At least 80% times you don't get it in a format. In most cases, all stakeholders would use this just as a dumping ground. They would just go and put inputs the way they just share it. And I think one of you gave an interesting example. They just share an announcement and they just go and dump it into AHA. And now they have an interesting tool, so they just go dump it. And that remains, it becomes the, uh, the issue for the product manager to actually review it. The idea is this year, at least what I'm preaching to my product managers, look at your backlog and reduce to, to the 10% of your backlog, right? Or at five kgs of your backlog. What that really means is review all your requirements and see if you can weed out the things that really don't make sense. Use this opportunity to actually classify, and this is an ongoing process. It can't just happen at the start of the year, but as a resolution, as a resolution we're looking at reducing that 10%, because if you look at it, the last five kgs are the most difficult to lose. Right? So we're looking at that, that aspect over here. Second is learn a new language. As I said, I'm planning to learn Spanish. I have an interesting customer who only speaks Spanish, so I'm, that is the motivation for me to learn Spanish. But I, I'm not started yet, but this is my resolution for this year. The idea is, how do you actually understand different languages that are spoken within your organization. How do you educate the rest of the organization to understand product management speak? What that really means is if you, if you hear a salesperson come and give you a requirement, uh, the requirement will sound something like, there is this requirement, we have to build it, and multiple customers are asking for it. What that roughly translates is there's one customer who has asked for the requirement, which if, if I have that feature in, I can actually get a demo opportunity next week, right? It, it really translates to that. Now, how do you understand the speak internally with each of the groups, whether it's sales, whether it is uh, developer, because you, for you to translate your requirements from business side to your developer, that's very interesting. You need to understand the developer speak. When someone says, this is important, we need to get it done as soon as possible. What is soon as possible, right? That language has to be understood. Soon as possible for sales is very different from product management, from development. So these are the different language speaks we're talking about. Marketing speak is how do you position your products? Similarly with exec, how do you actually get a buy-in from your execs and all of this? And use this opportunity to educate the rest of the organization with the product management speak. Sometimes we can, uh, we don't really understand that our audience are from a developer to a senior management. And sometimes our language, the requirements to flesh out may not really convey the same meaning. So how do you actually have these two, three variations where you talk about statement of direction, say, with management, talk about specific business use cases with sales, and talk about real requirements and user stories with the developer, right? So that's the whole idea about business week. Increase your agility and be, be a better sprinter. This is, again, uh, some of you are not following agile mode. With moving towards faster releases is, is the name, is, is the game that everyone's playing today. You want to release things faster so that there's faster time to value. Customers see the features as early as possible. So that's the whole idea. Declutter 2007, this is actually your 2018 calendar. So the whole idea is to kill meetings. Uh, someone asked me, does product managers need to be in every meeting? The answer is no, you can pick and choose. When you're getting into a mode where you want to be agile and adapt to changes, you don't need to get into fixed meetings. So that's the whole idea about that. The last one is making more effective roadmaps. This is the biggest challenge, I think, for product managers. We come up, we all, at the start of the year, come up with this nice fancy 18-month roadmap. 
and uh, you get into March, April, you've already made your first change. So drop 30% added something else. So, so this is something every product manager battles with. There are different variations, different views on this. Uh, people are moving towards theme-based product roadmaps instead of, us, instead of listing out specific requirements. They're also looking at uh, coming up with more like a statement of direction over the next three years and talking about specific roadmap items that can be delivered over the next three months, six months, and 18 months. The idea is I can go to my field, to my stakeholders and tell them, the next three months I can release things with 90% prediction, right, or 90% probability. Or the next six months, whatever I commit, I can release it with 70% probability. And things that are planned for the next 18 months, I can only assure you 50% probability. That actually helps you set expectations with your customers and internal stakeholders. So I'll leave you with this. This is just thoughts I thought I'll share as a closing comment. That's all I had. If there are any other questions on this, if you want to add to the resolutions, I'll probably open the floor. Anything else you think as, as you're learning in IPL, you can add to your resolutions for this year? My company. How do you um, so? How do you make sure you are the product manager? Okay, um, you have got list of requirements probably at a very high level themes. Um, you are trying to uh, you know get that work done uh, through your engineering team and you know get your product is running behind the market in a way. Okay, from from the <laughs> UI or usability or all these aspects, right? Uh, and then suddenly what happens is that some of the big customers comes and tries to hijack the overall roadmap. Now they are high paying people, okay? So you don't want to ignore them. Uh, they are good logos to have around you. Um, what kind of, I mean, have you experienced something similar to this in probably in your tenure so far? Uh, and how do you deal with such probably high profile customers? Do they listen to the no that you are saying? Uh, do they kind of you know appreciate the fact that you are straightforwardly saying no as an answer? Uh, or you have to you know kind of just do whatever they are saying? So the answers do you face this situation? Uh, simple answer is all the time. So it, it's it's not it's not unique to your organization, and uh, at least Metrics team, uh, in stage where it, we we need those big logo, logos, and all customers, all all vendors need big logos. So we get that. So what we really look at, or we're trying to get into a model where we're looking at the opportunity cost. So if I build X for a big customer, what is the opportunity cost that I lose? If, at the same time, if I could build something else. So when you really look at product management, we if you really play it with a numbers game and you're able to justify why certain things should be done or not be done, that's an easier battle to win. But if you just go with data with three customers, one big customer asking for something versus something else, the big customers always win. Right? Because that's a big logo, the management will say, yeah, we have to done, we have to get it done because that is opening up opportunities in a new area, you'll actually get it done. But one interesting perspective that we started, we started looking at is the uh, opportunity cost. Because sometimes when you're building something for a customer, which takes six months with six developers, in the same time, if I can build something else, and I can show that value in terms of numbers, that's an easier conversation to have. But at some points, there are customers who come up with really interesting requirements. We'll just go and build it. We know it's going to use, be helpful for everyone. Uh, but at each stage, again, if I go with the cloud first model, we'll have to see if that's going to make your product more complicated. Is it going to be useful for other customers? Those are parameters you need to use. But that's not, a, not an easy battle to win. Uh, but we're just, we're just trying to bring in new perspectives of an opportunity cost here. So we uh, we actually rely internally on the uh, you you heard about the M6 right that actually comprises not uh, other than customers that has SMEs domain experts we also have practice groups for each of the product lines there's a practice group that group actually huddles and makes decisions. So what we also did, it's a recent change in Metrics Stream, we've moved towards a fixed release cycle. 
so we don't have releases all over the all over the year we have releases only happening in june october and february so everything that comes in only happens in three releases in the year so that's a new trend that we've started in metrics team uh, second for the data the product manager has to take the call um, again it's it's about ensuring that the salesperson writes the detailed requirements provides the justification and provides the, the value that that feature will bring to the product and then end of it it's a product management call but these are again not not easy calls to take um, product manager and product marketing manager so so what we we've done is you know, the again going by answering your question right there are there are times when we get some very complex requirements coming in from like a large customer which will take us six months six developers that's a big big ask that's when we get the product marketing team involved to actually create more like a marketing requirement document that's a very interesting perspective so when you, when you get a one line requirement again that ties back to your answer too uh, it's always interesting to get the market perspective because the marketing team have access to competitors they have access to a larger customer base they also have access to your analysts who can actually vet this and if it's a getting into mrd process it's a long drawn process you need to get all the data points validated and you could need to build a business use case on why certain things have to be built just the way you're building a business use case on the opportunity cost by not building it similarly we also push the sales person to build a market a case or build an mrd so that we can actually vet it against what we are currently planning to do so it's all very situational based but there are different ways we've case, case by case and uh, we find different variations coming in different times sometimes it comes straight from top of management you just have to build it you build it but in most cases we are moving towards asking them for a mrd in certain cases a market requirement document more an outside in perspective understanding demand for that particular feature which regions what's the dollar value we may get by having the feature or not having the feature so that's that's something we are moving towards in fact we just had the session in in, in uh, december where we actually presented a mrd on why we had to do certain things in the product and actually asked for an additional budget for that So new product launch, uh, we typically start with the MRD process. So we don't really build it straight out. So it's first driven by business in terms of finding out the market for that particular product. Uh, look at the, uh, the the areas, geographies, look at our overall strategy, whether we want to enter that area, and we build it. There are multiple areas where we've actually gone ahead, did a market research, and found that there's not really a viable product. And we've actually dumped the product. In certain cases, we've gone ahead and released it. So it's mostly a market-driven activity than from a product manager. Product management comes into play probably at a later stage. Okay. Correct. The, then we translate the MRD into a... Uh, it, the, the way we have done with some of the products is we take the first set of customers and, uh, and try to make it work for them. Because we're not into the B2B space where you need to make it work for the entire universe. We look at a standard set of customers and we try to see if to make it work for that set of customers, not for all customers. It would be uh, monetization would primarily be ROI. Uh, we spoke about opportunity cost. Uh, that's one thing. Uh, also, sometimes it's also a strategic decision. It's not necessarily a monetization piece because in certain areas, if you're strong in certain areas, if you want to entire, you know, offer an entire suite of products, you need to have products in other areas too. So in those cases, it's also a strategic decision for us to invest in those areas. That, that's right. Yes. We look at the pipeline. We look at uh, all the upcoming deals pipeline. So that also fits in as an input to what is the market for that specific area. Because in a, in a domain like GRC, we have a suite of products, but there are always these secondary and tertiary areas, which we're always not sure whether we need to get into or not. But if there is a healthy demand for the next 12, 18 months, that forms as an input to the, the decision making process. Thank you. 
We are still in the process of building it, uh, but the whole idea is, till now, the apps were built with whatever data was coming in, we were just taking it. The product managers are not really defining what is the framework of what kind of data they need for their decision making. So now we're in the process where we're actually defining those parameters that get into the system. That's something we're working on. We don't we don't have like a ready answer yet, but that's something we're working on. Uh, we started out with just the web clicks that we spoke about the usage, but next we're getting into understanding the data quality itself. So that's the stage we're in right now. That's when I was addressing with the AI or machine learning, uh, but that's something we we still are figuring it out. Yep. Is there anything else for today, or we're good to go? Yeah, so thanks everyone, thanks thanks for having me here. And I'm, I'm hoping that I was able to share some of my experiences of what we're doing in Metricstream. Um, do get connected on LinkedIn. I know some of you have already connected with me on LinkedIn. Uh, you have my profile, I can share it with you. Do get connected and stay in touch. And if you have additional questions, I'll be more than happy to respond to you. Yeah, thanks everyone.